so David, thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to me and the students at the University of Waterloo. What you uh, focus on, I think, is very relevant to what we look at inside uh, the course that this is for. Uh, but I thought I would start by just asking you to say a little bit about the University of Toronto Innovation Policy Lab. Uh, you work there, it does very important work, and we should share that with the students. Um, yeah, happy to do so. Uh, so the Innovation Policy Lab is uh, an informal research and working group. Uh, we have 11 faculty members affiliated with the Monk School. Some are full-time appointees, some are affiliates like myself. Um, we undertake a wide range of um, research on uh, interdisciplinary questions uh, related to the way agency politics and institutions drive innovation um, and, and how social and uh, spatial distribution of innovation outcomes are determined. Um, we look at innovation ecosystems at all levels, the local, the regional, national, and the global. Um, and we, we some of our, my colleagues integrate that into the, the innovation teaching stream in the uh, Master of Global Affairs degree that we have at the Monk School as well. Very important and, you know, uh, uh, something which governments and, uh, and people concerned with policy uh, are thinking a lot about these days. Uh, I'm interested in what you have found about how the Canadian economy is being impacted by what we're calling the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I'm interested particularly, and you alluded to this in your description there, I'm interested in how it affects our overall economic strength, but also how it's affecting different sections of society. Uh, you mentioned uh, spatial and sectoral, I think, uh, but, uh, but clearly, you know, some areas benefit more from others, perhaps. Yeah, so we uh, we're just we just wrapped up actually a, a six year research project funded by Shirk on uh, what, what I call the creating digital opportunity for Canada. Um, we had several themes in the project. One, you know. Uh, one was where were our uh, areas of strength and uh, uh, in, in the digital economy, what you're calling the fourth industrial revolution. Um, we looked at uh, how different parts of the economy were being affected. Um, and we looked at uh, the spatial implications, you know, what, what were the hotspots in Canada for uh, developing new, new digital technologies and, and growing those parts of, uh, of, of the economy. And in, in some, Peter, you know, what we found is there is no sector of the economy today that is not being affected and altered in some way by digital technologies. Um, and that extends from uh, resource industries through manufacturing to many aspects of the service sector. Um, but the other thing that, that really I was not expecting to find when we began the project and came through loud and clear by the end of the project um, is there's been a tremendous shift over the past decade from a uh, focus on digital hardware, telecommunications, microchips, uh, you know, uh, networking equipment, um, a lot of the functionality that, that, you know, traditionally going back to the 1970s and 80s was embedded in the hardware is being transferred to the software. Um, so, so you're getting software upgrades to existing hardware that, you know, that takes the place of radically uh, having to uh, develop the next generation of hardware or, or replace the hardware completely. We've also seen the shift um, to, to platform economy, um, the emergence of new platform firms based on, you know, combination of cloud computing, data analytics, um, running over the internet uh, with tremendous reach uh, and, you know, at global scale. 
Um, and that's th these have been huge shifts. Um, you know, which which uh, one of the sources I like, you know, say really started with um, you know around nine, uh, 2008 uh, when the first uh, iPhones were introduced and when cloud computing really started to take hold. So so we're talking 12, 13 years, and 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 the pace of transformation that we've seen across the economy in that very, very short period of time is quite incredible. Absolutely, and what you're referring to there seems to suggest that it would enable change to happen more quickly. So if we're not having to install new hardware, if we're uh, uh, achieving higher levels or new levels of functionality, and we're able to access platforms that allow us to do things in different ways, that that perhaps suggests that that enables change to accelerate. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, several people who I've heard talk uh, over the last couple of years use the phrase um, digital disruption and, and you know, with, with an accelerating uh, pace of change and, and we are definitely experiencing uh, a faster rate of acceleration uh, in the innovation process itself. Um, and, and I think I think the the factor you just identified, the ability to improve functionality through software changes really contributes uh, tremendously to that accelerating pace. Um, you know, the fact that you, you, you can rewrite the code and, and the code can increasingly be written in components that are assembled together so you don't have to replace the entire code for a product or a piece of software. Um, so that just accelerates it even more. Very interesting. It's, it's giving a, a, a better understanding of why that acceleration is happening and how it's happening. It's very helpful to understand that. So. The, as far as Canada is concerned, what does this mean as far as the challenges that it might pose uh, or the opportunities that it creates as far as the Canadian economy is concerned? So it, it, it creates major challenges for us because we are uh, what gets classified as a small open trading economy. Basically, and you know, this goes back to uh, studies that were done for the McDonald Royal Commission in the 1980s. Um, uh, my favorite one is by Richard Harris, an economist from Simon Fraser. Uh, you know, the, the basic argument is that when you have an internal market the size of Canada's, you know, maximum of 36 or 37 million people, we are too small to grow uh, major world scale companies without going global from the get-go. So when you look at the companies that are scaling and have scaled very successfully uh, over the past decade, uh, particularly software and platform-oriented companies, Shopify in Ottawa, Lightspeed POS in Montreal, Wattpad in Toronto, they're companies that were designed to go uh, global uh, from the very beginning. Um, I don't know if you saw the news story this week, but there's a, a battle raging between uh, Shopify and um, the business newswire service, which is owned by Warren Buffett, that they distribute their their news uh, press releases on. They, they distributed a press release a couple of days ago about um, a new round of funding that they're raising. And uh, the press release service wants them to uh, identify a city that they are based in and Shopify wanted to say um, we aren't based in any city we are an internet based company and they got into a huge public spat with the the press release company so we're talking about old technology newspapers press wire releases and completely digitally oriented companies that that don't think of themselves you know even though you know they're their employees may be based in Ottawa, Toronto, Waterloo. They think of themselves as a company that exists in the cloud and serves their customers in the cloud. And that's the key to success. So, you know, so for a small open trading economy like Canada's, 
the companies that are going to be successful um, in the coming years are the ones that can think that way from the start, but then operationalize it, you know, put that strategy into effect right from the, the get-go. The challenge is that we, because we are relatively small, we are also technology takers. We are not going to design um, the next internet search engine. We are not going to design uh, the next uh, social media platform where everybody wants to hang out and share their pictures of their dinner with their friends um, or their cats or, or whatever it is that you know people love to do on those platforms. So, so we, um, and we have to be careful uh, that we are not dictated to in critical areas that you know are increasingly coming under the control of of these platform companies um and you know we've seen huge issues uh companies like airbnb you know affecting the rental market in major cities companies like uber dictating um transit policy to metropolitan governments um and, and if we're not forward think, and, and the other challenge about this accelerating pace of change is the technology and the technology companies uh, can innovate much faster than government policy can change. So government finds itself constantly in a position of playing catch up to the latest innovations. And if we're not thinking ahead and anticipating where those changes are gonna go and how we design policy to anticipate it, um, we're going to be caught flat-footed, and and we've seen numerous examples of that. We we, we saw it with the introduction of, of Uber into cities all across Canada three, four, five years ago, and municipal governments in almost every city were left trying to redefine their taxi regulations. Was Uber a taxi company? Was it a private service? Did, you know, did, did existing municipal regulations apply to it? Did they have to design new ones? And we ended up with an incredible patchwork of policy across the country as, as municipal governments scrambled to respond. And, and I think we're going to see that, you know, with increasing frequency. Do you have any sense of what we should do policy wise uh, in order to deal with this? I mean, it, a difficult question. If there was an easy answer, we might not be where we are today. No, I, I, well, I've given a lot of thought to it. I actually, I will send you the link as soon as we get off of uh, this uh, interview and you can share it with your students. Um, I did a major paper for the Institute for Research on Public Policy uh, towards the end of our project about a year and a half ago. It was released. It's on the IRP P website and there's actually a, a short podcast I did that goes with it which is also on the IRPP website. So there's lots of things that we could do. I mean the government, you know, the current federal government um, has had quite an ambitious agenda around uh, innovation policy. They've introduced a lot of measures. Uh, the jury is still out on some of them. I'm not sure how effect, whether they're all going to prove to be as effective as, as was intended. Um, one of the things that they haven't done is, is we have a desperate need for a national innovation agency. Um, the example that um, the examples that often come up are the innovation, the Israeli Innovation Authority, um, which you know transformed that country over a period of fifty or sixty years. But the other one closer to home is DARPA in the U.S. And I noticed that the uh, Business Council of Canada just did a pre-budget consultation with the Federal Minister of Finance, calling for a DARPA-type agency. I actually had that in, in our policy report uh, two years ago, so I'm glad to see they're catching up. Um, but, you know, DARPA has been a tremendously influential uh, organization in the U.S. Uh, the Internet, the original version of the Internet was a DARPA creation in the late 1960s, linking, I think, originally five or six research-intensive universities together. Uh, with the very first internet connections, developing all the protocols, TCP, IP, and the other protocols. Um, but my favorite example of, you know, what DARPA has and can do, or a DARPA-type agency, is automated vehicles. Nobody was talking about automated vehicles in 2005, when DARPA issued their first 
um, automated vehicle challenge and, and university teams, Stanford, uh, Carnegie Mellon, others across the US scrambled and put together research teams and, and started creating the first automated versions of automated vehicles to run the course that DARPA had set. And I think it took until the third challenge for one to successfully um, finish the course. Um, but that team, you know, got event eventually got bought by Google and is now embodied in Waymo. All the technology that was originally developed for that, you know, ended up being incorporated into, into Waymo, the Alphabet subsidiary. Um, but that's an example of how a forward thinking agency with a very small budget, I think they spent like five to seven million dollars on those challenges in total, can, can fundamentally up, you know, disrupt and, and transform a whole existing industry. Um, we, we've needed an agency like that for a long time. Uh, one of the recent federal budgets introduced a relatively small program at the NRC, the National Research Council, to do some of that. Um, but I think it needs to be, you know, expanded into, into a, a much bigger national agency alongside NRC. Um, we need a lot, of, um, a lot of support for Canadian firms to scale. We're very good at starting you know, innovative entrepreneurial startup firms. Waterloo is famous for that. Um, Toronto, it doesn't get nearly as much publicity as you do, but, but we're actually quite good at it in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, similarly. Um, but we're not nearly as good at scaling them. We have a tendency to grow those kind of firms to somewhere between um, a million and, uh, sorry, five, 50 million and 100 million in sales. And then if they are, thriving and successful, um, they tend to get bought out way too early, um, usually by the US, but not, you know, by US based companies, but not exclusively by the US. Um, we need to find ways to help those firms stay in Canadian hands um, and grow to global scale. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems we have is a lack of patient long-term capital uh, we've got some of the largest, most successful pension funds um, in the country, CPPIP, the Canada Pension Plan, um, the case in Quebec, OMERS, teachers in Ontario. Uh, but these funds are much, with the exception of the case, the, these funds are much more effective at uh, investing in infrastructure. You know, they're buying infrastructure all around the, the globe and they're some of the most successful pension funds at doing that. Um, they're not nearly as uh, focused on taking Canadian startup firms, investing in them and helping them grow to scale. Um, so we need, we need new kind, fresh kind of policy thinking on how to do that. Um, and and uh, we need, um, we need assistance to help them uh, access global markets. Um, you know, branding and marketing cooperatives are one idea that I discuss in, in the policy paper. Um, we need, and, but, but the other really critical problem is a lack of managerial talent. Uh, because we don't have a sufficient number of firms that have successfully scaled, we lack the global multinationals where people are trained and you know really gain hands-on experience in how to run a, a global technology firm. And, and then you get into a terrible chicken and egg question. If you don't have the talent to scale the firm, um, you know, how do you, and, and you don't have the firms to train the talent, uh, which comes first, right? How do, how, do you, how do you get people with the experience to do that? And too often in, um, in cases of firms that have grown rapidly, and one of your homegrown success stories in Waterloo is a classic example of that. You know, the, the people had to go outside the country and recruit managers to, to help build and scale the firm. Um, they came with specific skill sets, which weren't always the, you know, the best ones or, or, or the or most effective ones. Um, so, so we need to break out of that cycle. We, we need a, a federal strategy that focuses on putting the capital in place to keep the firms in Canadian hands, um, that helps them gain access to global markets, 
um, and helps train the managers that can grow those firms and, and you know, let them scale effectively. So those are all intertwined. We need a more effective um, cluster and innovation ecosystem strategy to support and grow um, you know, the, the local digital clusters. Uh, the, the only city in the country that really has a coordinated, effective cluster strategy with support from all levels of government, uh, you know, the provincial government, the regional development agency, the metropolitan government is, uh, is Montreal. Um, other cities, you know, will talk about it from time to time, but there's a lack of continuity. Um, and the federal government has tried several times over the past two decades to develop a cluster strategy, but it, it, it has, hasn't been terribly effective um, and it needs a more coordinated approach. Thank you. And at, at risk of uh, uh, going backwards in our discussion, you're describing uh, things we should be doing to become more innovative. Uh, just to confirm, uh, technology-based innovation is a good thing and a necessary thing for the Canadian economy. We haven't really, you know, uh, described why it's so important. And I thought maybe we should do that. Uh, before we go further? Um, it's important because uh, you have to innovate or get left behind. If, if you're not innovating, uh, your competitors are. Uh, the people who are going to be creating, um, you know, new opportunities, new products, new services, new jobs uh, are, the, are, are going to be innovating. Um, and, you know, we've, and, and they're going to disrupt your existing industry. So there, there is virtually no industry in the world at the moment that is not susceptible to disruption. And, and you can talk about mining, you can talk about um, energy production, oil and gas, you can talk about agriculture, you can talk about manufacturing, you can talk about, um, you know, the, the hotel industry, the taxi industry, all the examples I've been giving you, Peter, um, you know, newspapers and magazines, the huge fight with Facebook that's going on in Australia and is coming to Canada shortly because of the way it's disrupted the traditional news industry, print journalism, online broadcasting. Um, there is no, there is virtually no industry that is protected against that kind of disruption from digital technologies. And so, of necessity, we need to innovate and we need to have firms based in Canada that are innovating like that. Uh, but there's a downside to it. And the downside to it is labor displacement. So, so with, you know, digital transformation comes a lot of occupational and skill change. Um, some jobs are going to be eliminated entirely. And the jobs that aren't eliminated entirely are going to be transform the skill requirements of those jobs are going to be very different than what they were in the pre-digital age. And so along with your innovation strategy, you need a, an education and a continuing vocational education and training strategy to ensure that the people who are being displaced have access to new skills and appropriate skills. And, and that's very challenging because you're not going to take someone, um, you know, in their 40s or their 50s who maybe worked on an assembly line um, at, at, at Oshawa or Oakville or Brampton and turn them into a computer programmer or a computer coder. But yet there are a lot of skills those people have that may end up being valuable uh, in certain segments of, 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 you know, the transformed economy. So you need careful matching of people's uh, current skills of their background and training with the new job opportunities or, or the changing uh, skill requirements of those jobs to try to make sure that they get, you know, they end up with the right skill mix. So and we're behind on that too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But the, uh, as, so, so it's fairly clear, we, we have to innovate uh, or we'll be left behind, our economy will deteriorate. If we can innovate well, 
uh, then we we have the possibility of uh, you know high levels of economic prosperity uh, and good lives for people in Canada. But if we don't, then people's lives will be poor. Fairly simple. And, and you know we we see that very clearly in our productivity statistics. Okay, we have not done a good job of innovating. Um, our, our levels of productivity, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., I, I mean, we still have a relatively high, high level of productivity and productivity growth compared to the rest of the world, but compared to our main competitors south of the border, uh, our levels of productivity increase have been declining for 20 or more years. Um, there, there's an enormous debate in the economics literature about why that is occurring, what the key factors are. I'm very biased in my reading of that literature. I, I attribute it to um, a lack of adoption of digital technologies. Those industries that have experienced the most rapid productivity growth are the ones that have made the most effective use of digital technologies. So part of the problem we have in Canada is that existing businesses have been relatively slow to upgrade and to adopt and incorporate um, the latest digital technology. And that means that they are gradually falling behind as well without making that transformation. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating area to consider how, uh, you know, existing businesses can compete and transform uh, to survive uh, versus the new businesses that are uh, new areas of uh, development and technology based companies uh, uh, that are happening now. Just to look at some of the brand names that we've seen disappear, uh, who should have been able to see it coming and who did do things to try to uh, survive but weren't able to is, uh, you know, is indicative, I guess, of, of the position that there is. Uh, they do seem to have this difficulty in, uh, uh, in, in, in being able to change and transform. Uh, I thought I'd ask you about the resource sector, the, the Canadian economy. Uh, this is clearly a large part of it. Uh, what do you see as the impact there as far as the digital economy is concerned? Um. Well, there's all sorts of ways in which it's being impacted. Um, you know, the pulp and paper industry is, you know, has been a classic source of Canadian strength. Uh, it's been incredibly, the demand for pulp and paper has incredi been incredibly impacted by the digitization of the news business. You know, the fact that people aren't consuming their news in print. Um, I don't know about, you know, your family or your children um, or your students, uh, but mine don't ever read a print newspaper. All of their news is consumed on their phones. Well, think of all the pulp and paper that used to be produced, you know, to provide those glossy magazines, news magazines that don't, some of which don't even exist anymore, uh, or, or the newspapers. My daily newspaper is a fraction of the size it was when I first started reading it decades ago. Um, so, so that's one way in which they're being influenced. But other, other sector, you know, the same can't be said of agriculture. We, we are always going to need to eat, um, but the way our food is cultivated and grown um, is being incredibly affected by digital technologies. Um, you know, there, my colleagues in Saskatchewan who were studying, um, you know, the, the agricultural sector as part of our project started talking very, very early on in the project and, and quite caught me off guard about the, the looming battle between the farmers and the equipment manufacturers like John Deere because the, that equipment is all digitally controlled. Um, and it collects a tremendous amount of data on uh, field conditions, on crop conditions as it passes over the land. Um, and there's a huge IP battle raging between the equipment manufacturers and the farmers over who owns the data, who controls the data, and who controls the IP 
that the that the equipment uh, you know collects. The farmers say it's their data, and they want to own and control it. And the equipment manufacturers say no, it's embedded in our machinery, and we own the IP. We own the IP that collects the data. We own the resulting data. And it's an example of where you know government policy is is struggling to keep up in, in terms of how how do we define you know how do we create policies that can protect the interests of our farmers, but you know make sure they have access to the equipment they need to to cultivate their lands, their fields. Um, that that's one example. Um, there's another you know. Uh, growing company in Winnipeg that I first came across in the research three or four years ago. It's been in the news a lot the last couple of weeks, a company called Farmer's Edge, which uses digital technology to, you know, collect all sorts of information relevant to farmers and, and disseminate it to them. So they've created a whole new business model around the ability to, you know, to organize and disseminate that information and data digitally to farmers. Um, so we see lots of examples of that uh, across the resource sectors. Mining, um, you know, the use of, of automated vehicles in mines is a huge uh, phenomenon. Uh, but again, we lag much more common in Australia, which has in, in some ways a more advanced mining industry than ours, um, than, than, it is, than it has been to date in Canadian mines. I think Canadian mines are, are starting to catch up. So lots of examples, uh, you know, in the agricultural sector and in the manufacturing sector, you know, tremendous pace of automation in, in factories all across the board. Interesting. And you also focus on regional and local economic policy. Uh, I, I'm interested in what can be done at those levels uh, to be able to, you know, to impact the economy uh, and particularly how regional ecosystems might support digital innovation. What needs to be there for an, a, a, a region or a local area uh, to be more successful as far as innovation goes? There the challenge is um, how do we, what kinds of institutional and organizational supports do we have to um, to build the, these clusters of firms or, uh, you know, innovation ecosystems, as, as you called them. Um, we don't have effective policies to, to provide support to them. Uh, the having worked in government, um, one, of, one of the painful lessons I learned is that most policies are designed with a particular focus, policy focus, policy objective, um, we government policymakers don't tend to think in geographic terms. They they think of you know a national policy or provincial policy that will apply to all the relevant firms within their jurisdiction, but they don't design the policy or think of the policy in terms of its geographic impact, um, and they often operate in what. Um, we in the public policy field refer to as policy silos. So they go up and down a smoke smokestack or policy silo in their respective area, and they don't think horizontally. How does their specific policy interact um, with other relevant policies? But when you talk to a digital firm, you know, in Waterloo, um, at the Communitech Accelerator or any of the other number of sites you have in Waterloo, the Velocity Garage, any of the places that exist in Waterloo, um, they don't think in those terms. They think of, you know, what's my market? Who are my competitors? What's my challenge? Um, what do I have to do to keep growing and expanding? Where is my talent going to come from? And then they start to look out and say, okay, well, what's the range of, you know, prospective policy supports that exist that could help me? Um, and how do I tap into them? And how do I blend them to meet my particular needs and my, you know, my firm, my sector, um, my local cluster, my region of the province? Um, and, and it's, there's a disconnect between the way the firms think about 
growing and you know expanding their markets and way, the way policymakers think about designing and implementing policies. And the middle ground where the two meet is the local innovation ecosystem or the cluster. Um, and I've long argued that, that cluster organizations where they exist can provide an invaluable service to local firms by mediating between the federally or provincially designed policies and programs and the demands and needs of the local firms. Um, and they can also pri provide invaluable feedback to policymakers um, in terms of how well or how effectively those programs are meeting the needs of the local firms. So it's, it's you know, one of the things that Communitech has done uh, tremendously well in Waterloo over the last, what's going on 25 years. I think I first encountered Communitech the first time I went into Waterloo to interview firms in 1997-98. Um, and they were, you know, fairly small then just starting out nowhere near on the scale that they've become today. But they had this agenda of, you know, pooling a common set of um, resources together to provide supports for the local firms in your region. Um, and over the years, they've been, I've watched them, they've been tremendously effective at tailoring their needs to fit into the parameters of existing federal and provincial programs. So they'll, they'll take an existing federal provincial program, but they'll adapt it in a way that serves the needs of the local firms in, in, in Waterloo region. And, and that's you know, a hugely valuable role that those kinds of uh, cluster-based organizations can play at the local level. So, but we need a more effective you know, national and provincial strategy to support those. We don't need a lot more money, but we need a strategy that, that helps build and support those kinds of organizations and then links them together. There's a tremendous opportunity uh, for peer-to-peer -peer learning. You know, one of the things cluster organizations do quite well, Tech Toronto does it. Uh, we've worked with them in Toronto, Communitech does it in Waterloo. Um, one of the things they can do quite well is provide peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities for the firms that, that you know, are within their cluster. Um, but there's also an opportunity provincially or nationally for peer-to-peer -peer learning among cluster organizations. It's what I call you know, low-hanging fruit. It's not going to cost a lot for any government to build those kinds of networking peer-to-peer -peer relations among cluster organizations, but it has a huge potential to deliver benefits. That seems very important to understand the mechanism through which the various uh, uh, resources that are available to businesses uh, connect with those businesses themselves. And of course, the way you're mentioning there, uh, that knowledge is shared between businesses and support provided. Uh, really, what you seem to be talking about is that at a regional and local level, it, it, it's un, there is the the connection that's necessary to make it all work, and you're saying there needs need to be agents like Communitech who perform that connection role, uh, and uh, that that seems to be very important. Uh, the government, the federal government or provincial government, can make things available, but there needs to be a, a, an active. Uh, you know, a designed way of pulling it all together. And I think you need, I think you need on, you know, feet on the ground and eyes on the ground, like organizations with deep contextual knowledge of the, the firms and the clusters of firms within their region um, who can, who can, you know, help deliver the services to, to their member firms, but also provide the feedback to government policymakers. Okay, seems very valuable. As far as, and to take it on to another uh, uh, level, I guess, or another focus, uh, globalization, moving right from local to global, uh, is, I think in your description, you would consider to be beneficial for the Canadian economy, but it's an area where there is some uh, debate and discussion 
at the moment about how desirable it might be and what policy should be uh, in respect of it. And I thought I'd ask for your thoughts about globalization. So so again, globalization is a double-edged sword. It uh, delivers tremendous benefits. Um, you know, ask any uh, shopper who goes into a big box uh, retail store and, and, you know, and can buy products at a fraction of the cost, you know, they would have been 20 or 30 years ago because they're produced, you know, in some other part of the world, uh, shipped in, you know, very efficiently in huge container ships tracked with RFID tags on them so the both the shipper and the retail store knows exactly where the product is at any point in its journey. So, so that's the upside. Uh, but if those products were made in southern Ontario or Quebec or the Midwest in the U.S. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and they're not being made there today, um, so people in those communities have lost their jobs. Um, and the plants where they, you know, they worked or their families may have worked for generations are gone. And you, you see this story uh, all across parts of Europe. You see it across, you know, huge swaths of the United States. And, and we've seen not, not as much of it, but still enough to be painful um, in parts of southern Ontario. I remember doing work in Welland, uh, Ontario, about 15 years ago with the local economic development officials and they were facing huge disruption in the auto parts sector, the machine tool and die sector. Um, so that's the downside of globalization. Um, the upside is that, you know, as I said at the outset, it creates huge new market opportunities for us, but not necessarily in the same sectors and the same products or the same product mix that you know, existed 20 or 30 years ago. And we have to be nimble to, uh, you know, discern where the, the demand is going to emerge and where we have the capabilities and, and skills in Canada to grow firms and employ people and, and meet that demand. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one of the areas where we've had a tremendous strength in this country, and I go back to the rise of Nortel in uh, the mid 1970s in Ottawa. Um, the first Nortel digital switch was actually installed on a, a street in Ottawa called Harmer Avenue, which was on my way from my home to my public school as I was growing up. Now I was long out of public school by the time they installed that digital switch. But, but I walked by that street twice a day, every day on my way to and from school. And, and it's important because it was that digital switch that, you know, that transformed the mechanical aspect of the telecommunications industry into a digital one. It, it broke wide open the US market um, it, with the regional bell operating companies that were spun out of AT&T um, in the early 1980s. Um, and gave Nortel that incredible opportunity, but it was, they were hugely software based, right? And, and Nortel always had great software capabilities and the other telecom firms that grew up and prospered like uh, Terry Matthews, Newbridge Networks, um, had a tremendous software component in them. So, you know, the same is true with BlackBerry in, in, in Waterloo. So, we, so we've long had, since the start of the digital age in Canada, which I really date from the mid 70s, um, we've had great software strengths. Um, at different points, we've had successful hardware companies, but those are disappearing. Um, you know, ATI in Toronto, uh, JDS Uniface in Ottawa, um, Nortel, you know, the, the companies that, that made their name in hardware are the ones that have been uprooted and displaced. But they've been replaced by the ones like Shopify and Wattpad that I talked about at the outset that have really capitalized on this shift to, to software. Um, and that's where I think our opportunities are going to lie going forward is, is the ability to um, to both incorporate software into existing products and to develop whole new firms, um, lines of services that, that rely on software platform technologies. Um, and that's where I think, you know, our comparative advantage is going to lie 
in what you know you're calling the the fourth industrial revolution, and that's where we we should be focusing. I've got two for, two final questions. The first one is uh, the automotive sector. You've done work there. It's going through a lot of changes at the moment. So I thought I would uh, you know pick your brain about that. What do you what do you think the future holds uh, about the automotive sector and what are the economic policy implications there? So I'm one of those people who thinks that the automobile is going to become a digital platform like our home and our place of work. I think, I think there will be three digital platforms where we access um, you know, all of our digital products and services going forward. Uh, our home right now because of COVID is the dominant one. At some point, if we're lucky, we might get back into our places of work or study, our schools and universities. That's the second one, but the automobile is clearly going to become the third one. Um, so automobiles are being digitized at a furious pace. I, I see you know, articles about the lines, the number of lines of code in the existing automobile, um, in, in all existing automobiles, and it, it's you know, millions of lines of code embedded in, in every automobile that's going onto the road these days. Uh, connectivity between automobiles is a huge issue um, for both for communication services. Um, you know, General Motors, when they shut down the assembly plant for a while in Oshawa, um, they argued they were replacing it with the Canadian Technology Centre based partly in Oshawa and partly in Markham. I've been up visiting that centre. It's, it's software programmers, you know, 700 software programmers writing new code to, um, you know, allow vehicles to communicate with services like their OnStar service to allow, you know, customers to use their, um, their mobile devices in the car and to interface seamlessly, uh, you know, with their devices through the car's uh, communication services. And increasingly, it's going to allow cars to communicate with each other, and that's where the automated vehicles uh, come into effect. Um, and, and, and it will gradually, slowly but surely, it's going to gradually get in, um, integrated into a broader set of mobility services. So we've seen, you know, on-demand mobility services like Uber, but we, we've also got, you know, local companies like Myovision and Waterloo that are developing uh, different services for public transit agencies. Um, and, and we've seen in different parts of the U.S., Los Angeles was experimenting with this for a while, you know, apps that you can carry around on your phone that basically integrate all available public services, ride sharing, uh, public transit, uh, public taxis. You, you, you're going to be able to get information about um, the most effective ones, uh, you know, right on your phone. And we're starting to see... Um, the last sector where this is being uh, felt is, is the public transit services, but, but we're starting to see a shift, mostly in smaller communities, but I think it's going to come to the bigger cities gradually, to, uh, away from fixed route transportation services where, you know, a bus can run or, or a tram or, or a, an LRT can run half empty because the demand's not there. We're going to see the shift of that gradually because of digital technology to on-demand services, where the routes will be designed uh, by demand through digital, you know, digital technologies, and where you know the, the wait times for people waiting for the bus or the tram to arrive will be reduced, um, and it'll be much much more efficient. Um, and then finally, we're going to see it, you know, with the transformation of the automotive industry. Um, so, so the automobile of 2035, the, the, the manufacturers, the OEMs are referring to these as case vehicles, connected, automated, shared, and electric. And that's the acronym that increasingly is being used in the sector. Um, and the timing of your interview is very good, Peter, because the Council of Canadian Academies is releasing their report um, on connected, automated, and shared vehicles at a shared mobility at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. 
So if your students go to the, the CCA website, they'll be able to download the expert panel report on what the future of these vehicles means for Canada. Um, but, but it's coming. And, and all of the automakers are racing to transform. Uh, uh, you know, electrification is being dealt with as one part of the transformation um, around the, you know, the, the mode of forces that's going to drive these cars to shift away from internal combustion engines to either battery electric or fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, but when you listen to the automakers talk about it, they don't talk about electric as one set of technologies and connected and automated as a second set. The, you know, any electric vehicle, any connected and automated vehicle that they bring to market is going to be an electric vehicle. So, so the, they are thinking increasingly about how the technologies get integrated into the automobile. Um, and in Canada, um, we were at risk of being left behind, particularly on the electric side. But I think the latest round of negotiations between the union, uh, Unifor, and the automakers, uh, you know, produced some very interesting results for, for us. Um, and then I think other organizations have really been doing some forward thinking. Uh, the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association has been way out in front with their Project Arrow um, competition to come up with a design. Uh, an engineering team from one university produced the design, and another team is going to start producing components, you know, producing the, the vehicle that was designed. Um, and they're looking to create opportunities for automotive parts manufacturers but also electronic and software companies, you know, from all over the province and all over the country to design components that can go into this vehicle. Um, so I think, um, I think that's the kind of forward thinking that we're going to need to, you know, to maintain a, a strong and vital place for the automotive sector in Canada. But, it, but, but we're going to be, uh, it's going to be a very different sector. Um, and, you know, in the last story I like to tell is what I heard from uh, General Motors. One of the things that they're most proud of um, is not their work on automobiles, but they've actually in Oshawa, they designed a collapsible electric bicycle uh, at the technology center in Oshawa. So they, what they're conceiving is, you know, someone's going to, uh, drive their General Motors vehicle to their local uh, GO Transit stop, uh, take the GO train to, you know, wherever they're working, get out of the train with their collapsed uh, electric bicycle under their arm, unpack it and ride the last kilometer or two kilometers to their place of work on their electric bicycle. So, that, so they're thinking in terms of mobility solutions, the automakers themselves, you know, I hear the same thing from Ford and Stellantis, that they're thinking increasingly in terms of being in the mobility solutions business rather than the automobile manufacturing business. And that's the, the, the you know, and that's all going to be digitally enabled. It's a massive change for that sector. I think it's fascinating to watch and very easy to watch because so much is reported about it, but uh, uh, lots of change to come. My final question is around uh, one that I ask everybody I interview uh, about the advice you would give to students uh, who are likely to be graduating soon and embarking on their future careers. And uh, I'm just keen to provide them with the benefit of your, uh, uh, of your own career and how you have, uh, how you viewed that. Um, well, I think so I think as students at a Canadian university, they have a tremendous advantage. Um, and, you know, the first advantage they have is they're getting a first class education at a public university. They're going to graduate without mountains of debt. When you look at the huge debate that's raising, raging in the U.S. government right now between President Biden and some of his critics within the Democratic Party over student debt forgiveness, that's, not, that, that's one debate we're not going to have in Canada. So uh, I think we're very blessed 
um, you know, with the foresight of people in the 1950s and 1960s who designed our current system. Um, so I think they should be thankful for that, for, you know, the foresightedness of those people who designed that system. And I'm, you and I are beneficiaries, well, at least I'm a beneficiary of it as well. I presume you are too. Um, but I think going forward, um, the one piece of advice I would give is that whatever job they do, whatever sector of the economy they're in, whether, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily have to be engineers or computer scientists. Um, they can be social science graduates. They can be business and, and finance graduates. The jobs they're going to be doing are going to be digitally enabled jobs. They're going to be working with increasingly sophisticated digital technologies, you know, including machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning. Um, and it's a subject that I'm fascinated by, uh, but, but the more I read on it, the more uh, I come to the conclusion that those technologies are not going to be human replacing technologies. Um, there's a lot of literature out there that says, you know, all our jobs are going to be done by AI programs in the future. Um, but I think the more um, sensitive and perceptive analysis is, is, is analysis that says the jobs we're doing are going to be AI enabled. So, so we are going to need to learn, um, particularly, you know, coming graduates are going to need to learn to work effectively alongside those digital technologies. And they're going to have to concentrate on the skills that humans still have best, you know, do best. And those are the emotional skills, the interpersonal skills, um, so somebody at Harvard a long time ago developed something called the EQ, the emotional quotient to go along with intelligent quotient. Uh, and my sense is that um, EQ oriented skills are going to be the ones that really differentiate us from the, as humans from the technology. And they're going to be the skills where we have to concentrate most. And, and, and frontline workers, right? We've seen this with COVID. Um, the, the healthcare system, uh, the delivery system, all the jobs that, you know, for decades we probably took for granted. Uh, in, in a crisis like the pandemic, those are the ones that we see as being really valuable. But those jobs can be, you know, enhanced, improved as well through, through digital technology. The countries that have done the best with, um, with managing the pandemic are the ones that had the most sophisticated tracking systems in place, the ones that could integrate uh, public health care data systems, databases on individuals with immigration databases. Um, all the things that we don't do particularly well in Canada because we have a highly fragmented uh, public health care system. We have 13 national data systems as opposed to Singapore or Korea or Taiwan, which has one integrated national data system, right? So, so we're also going to need to think about how, you know, in those, in those traditionally service-oriented jobs, like in the healthcare sector, how we integrate and manage our, our data systems much more effectively, you know, to protect us and to benefit us. So those are the areas in which, you know, I think these kinds of changes are going to have the biggest implications for students graduating in the next couple of years. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today, David. I really appreciate it. I know the students are going to find it valuable. So, uh, you know, thank you very much for doing it. My pleasure, and I hope they enjoy it. And I